Good morning. Good morning and welcome to this lovely Wednesday here together at Moore College. Uh, it's been a great week so far of thinking about a theology of the Christian life, and I'm very much looking forward to thinking again this morning on this topic. It's been a very great privilege for us to have Dr. Kelly Capek with us here uh, from the Holy Land um, <laughs> of the United States of America, Tennessee, which is actually, we're both native to California originally, but Tennessee, which is in fact, I think my favorite state in terms of beauty. Um, maybe I'll just draw the line, I'll say for beauty's sake, yeah. But um, I really, really am grateful to have um, Kelly with us, and it's been a privilege to interact with him and, and to learn from him in these lectures. Um, just as we've been talking about some of the resources that have been available, Kelly has quite a few books around, but I, I just thought I would commend to you his most recent one, You're Only Human. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be doing a podcast on this material a little bit uh, for the Center for Christian Living, uh, which will be released soon, but I've been reading this and enjoying it. And I think uh, for those of you that have been you know, tuning in for these lectures, you'll find um, some common threads, uh, not exactly the same, but a lot of the application, I think, of the theology that he's been speaking to, um, bearing down on us in a book like this, and I, I would commend it to you. So please check that out. Um, just for those that are watching online, I want to say a welcome to you. We're very glad that you're joining us here, and for any guests that may be among us and not part of our, uh, our usual college cohort, uh, we're very glad that you would join with us this week, and you are most welcome uh, for those that are here in, in person, we'll look forward to having morning tea and fellowship outside on this sunny day uh, after this lecture. After the lecture, uh, the formal part of the lecture, we will have a chance to have some questions for uh, Dr. Kapik. And so you can submit those through the Slido app. Uh, the code for that uh, for today is AMCL10022. That's the date. And if you'd like, you can use the QR code. Uh, you can use the web, or you could use the app, and uh, know, know that you can look on, on there for questions that may be similar to your own. Uh, if you vote them up, that means they'll be more likely to be asked. I'm the one that's going to be asking them to him, so uh, make sure that you vote them up. And just a reminder, again, um, that you would uh, take care as you, vote, as you write these questions to, um, uh, to honor the Lord and what we say in that space and how we can encourage one another through those questions. Uh, the lectures will be recorded, as they have been all week, and they'll be available for a week long to watch online, and so we invite you to do that. And just before I pray, I'm going to read to us a few Bible readings uh, to begin our time together. So please listen in. You don't need to turn. Just listen in. In John 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In Ephesians 2, Paul writes, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Finally, we listen to Hebrews chapter 2. In verse 10 and following. For it was fitting that he, by whom, uh, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies 
and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. Please join with me in prayer. Father, these are rich readings that show us just how wonderful it is that you gave us your son, Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, the one who brings us peace, the one who went before us and suffered, suffered as a man so that we could be set free from death and the power of the devil and from our sin. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the privilege to meet this morning to consider the riches of Christ and how they bear upon our lives, what it means for us to follow after Christ in this Christian life. Please, Lord, help us to be informed and transformed and help us as a community to be edified in Jesus. Father, we thank you for the privilege of meeting here in this college, a college that trusts your word and contends for it and gospel truth college that cares about a world being saved as they know the power of Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, for this land that we meet on. We thank you for the Gadigal people who were here before us. And we do pray, Lord, even as we think about the truths of Christ bearing upon us, the reconciliation that we've known with one another, that we would think hard about reconciliation with the first peoples of this land, and indeed all people who have settled after. Please, Lord, Help us to think about these things in truth and build us up in the love of you. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Please welcome with me Dr. Kelly Capick. It's good to be with you again. The reason I called this meeting this morning as we have something to talk about that may derail the whole series. After my talk yesterday, I was told I had done a major faux pas. Some of you right now are in panic. <laughs> and here it is. Apparently, I offended some of you because I kept talking about Legos. <laughs> I, don't, I asked my wife last night, and I'm just not going to back down. <laughs> Apparently, you call multiple pieces of Legos Lego? <laughs> the roots of platonic thought are deep here. <laughs> they, just, they just sense this, this essence or something. I don't know, but I'm really not sure if we can overcome this divide. But there's... Uh, no better time then to turn our gaze to Christ who can unite us. <laughs> Let's pray. Our Father, we do thank you again for the great gifts of your Son and Spirit, and we ask that even in this time, that you would surprise, that you would nourish, you would challenge, you would stretch us. May mystery be our friend, even as you have made yourself most clearly known in and through your Son and by your Spirit. We pray this in the name of the risen King, who even now reigns and rules. Amen. So as we've been talking about this idea of the Christian life and avoiding um, uh, kind of uh, false dichotomies and then trying, trying to think through the love of God from creation, right, and shalom, and as we talked about how sin affects things all the way um, through Christ and then into our lives, today we will be focused on grace, Grace, but by grace here, I mean God's gift embodied in Jesus the mediator. Jesus the mediator. So I want to start by this idea of being human and a human knowledge of God. A theology of the Christian life must always emphasize that the creator is also, always, also the sustainer and redeemer. This threefold framework united in the one God helps us see that human life was good, meant to be good. But then in light of the fall, that is why repentance and lament are both vital, because the good has been distorted. 
But it also helps us see how the creator God is also the same God who's able to make it whole again. I know in this setting, I'm assuming we're all on the same page, but we should remind ourselves we don't have three different deities. Nor is the eternal God evolving to fit the times. No, no, no. Our God, our one God, acts in history to heal us. Specifically, the Son of God sent by the Father in the Spirit to become, the true, to become truly the Son of Adam. In this way, human life is framed by both the first and final Adam. We are needing to connect both creation and recreation. And in the person and work of Jesus, we will discover the great grace of our God. A grace that not only lights up God's glory, but also the glory of human creatures. There's an Eastern Orthodox theologian, John Anthony McGoughlin, who, who not too long ago observed in his book on the history of Eastern Orthodoxy, he said this in, near the end, and it really caught my attention, and I really agreed with it. He said, the real problem today is not that men and women have become secularized, non-religious or whatever, that they have lost their sense of God. Now watch what he says. The problem is that they have lost their sense of what it means to be truly human. I actually agree with that. I agree with that, especially if you understand what I think is biblically, theologically, just really, at the essence of what it means to be human. Because humans from the beginning were always designed to worship and commune with God. That's not just an add-on. That's just not like a bonus, like, oh, you're, you're spiritual, so you're also adding on spirituality to being human. No, no, no. This is part of who we are. God's original, continuing, and final intent for human life is that the, the human creature would experience communion with God. There may be more to human life than that, but there is not less to it. So when worship is disrupted, ignored, or perverted, the fullness of human flourishing is compromised and love is disordered. We were made to rightly, as I keep saying, rightly love God, neighbor, earth, and even self. And this is important because in our day, I, I actually like the language of human flourishing, but human flourishing now is used in all kinds of contexts, and when it's detached from a Christian theological context, it can mean just about anything. But human flourishing in a Christian context needs to have that fourfold dynamic of right relations with God, neighbor, earth, self. It's what we call shalom. So how do we love and delight? How does love and delight fit into this relationship with God? There's a lot more I could say on that. We, we often reduce what we'd want to say to it to words, good words like worship and praise. Not because God needs an ego boost, but because it's what we are made to do in recognition of who this God is and his creation. John Zizoulas, another very capable theologian, also from the East. He argued at one point that humans are, and these are his words, are at the end of creation. He's thinking of the Genesis narrative. They're at the end of creation. You ever thought about that? Like, why are they at the end? And he argues that God did this because humans are, as he says, the highest of all creatures who are to bring the entire material world into communion with God. In other words, humankind is the crowning glory of creation. We were meant to have this function, not merely experiencing one's own awareness of God, but humans were meant to be the conduit through which the rest of creation would experience the fullness of shalom. I'll be circling back to that near the very end of the talk. We talk about the book of Revelation. This was God's original design. That is not a revised plan in light of sin. Appreciating the grace of God and the significance of the person and work of Christ requires we constantly keep in mind creation's original purposes as well as an eschatological vision. Now, if we had more time, I would really unpack this, but I want to 
I do, I don't want to skip this. We need to, again, revisit the problem of sin very quickly. If we're made to love God, neighbor, earth, self, then part of a way to understand sin and the problem of sin is that it affects all of those things. This is part of, you've probably, many of you have heard this language of total depravity. Total depravity never meant, in the tradition, rightly understood, it never meant humans are as bad as they could be. Uh, it never, it meant that humans in our totality are affected by sin. There's no aspect of us and the created world that is not affected by sin. And so in this way, to put it simply, sin has affected our relationship with God, neighbor, earth, and even self. It's affected everything. And so at some point, if we would unpack this problem of sin, you, you, you might legitimately ask, well, why doesn't God, in light of the problem of sin, why doesn't God just go, healed? Right? You're, in this room, my guess is you're very familiar with the Christian story, and sometimes we're so familiar with it, the wonder and extravagance of it gets lost on us. So I just want you to think, why doesn't God just go, it's okay, it's done, I forgive, it's all right. He doesn't. Why the need for an incarnation? Why the need for suffering death? and resurrection. This takes us to the, the center of this talk today, the need of a mediator. The need of a mediator. In the city of God, written by Augustine, as he unpacks this, at one point he says this, the Son of God assuming humanity without ceasing to be God, right? The Son of God assumes a human nature, but he does such so in a way that he never ceases to be God. Be careful of people who interpret Philippians 2 in a way that somehow the son ceases to be God. He gives up his divinity to be, no, 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 no. That's not classic orthodoxy. I don't think it's biblical. But Augustine says, the son of God, assuming humanity without ceasing to be God, established and founded this same faith so that men or humanity might have a path. Now listen to this language. That humanity might have a path to man's God through the man who was God. Have a path to man's God. This is not meant to be a sexist statement, and sorry, a lot of the translations I'm using older, but a path to man's God through the man who was God. The mediator is the way. Here, he goes on to describe how God, in, in light of the problem of sinful humanity, he says, God being the goal and man the way. God is the goal, but the way is through a human. Here he's reflecting on John 14, 6, the way, the truth, and the life. How the Savior is always necessarily the uncreated word, the logos, the eternal logos, who also then in some strange way becomes created man by taking a particular, true, full human nature. In John's gospel, August, Augustine says this, and I, I remember I read this after I finished that book, You're Only Human, but it relates to that book as well and, and, and the ideas. And so if you, if you fall asleep for everything else I'm going to say, listen to this quote from Augustine. He said, he knew how, God through the Son, he knew how at the same time to hate in each of us what we made and to love what he made. Let's just think about that for a minute. God knew how in the Son, by the Spirit, to hate what we have made, and by that, in the context, he means sin. God knows how to hate what we made, that sinful, distorted part, while he also loves what he made, that is, us in his image. Now, there, that could take us the, the rest of the time to unpack, and in some ways, I'm, I'm going to, but I, I want you to think this, because put it in the back of your head, one of the challenges I think we have in Christian circles is we'll take a text like Galatians 2 or whatever, and we'll say, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. 
And one of the things I've found very commonly, maybe particularly in, in our, I'm a Reformed theologian, in Reformed circles, is we struggle to believe that God actually loves you. We think he hates you. And since you've been crucified with Christ and you no longer live, Christ lives in you. He actually doesn't love you. He loves Christ. Question, does God like you? That's a, that's a longer conversation, but here what Augustine is saying is God actually does love what he made. He loves you as a human creature. He doesn't love the sin that distorts you, and so he's committed to the renewal of what he loves. We'll talk more about that later. This is Augustine's way of making sure he, he does not belittle God's good creation, nor does he belittle the problem of sin. All right, let's keep going. So let's talk about a just, faithful, and loving mediator. A theologian you may not have heard of, Caspar Olivianus, 1536 to 1587. Those of you, anyone pregnant, Caspar, that's a name up for grabs if you want to use that. Was Caspar the friendly ghost a thing here back in the day? All right. This is a, a great Protestant Reformed theologian. But he represents early Protestant efforts to articulate the importance of Christ as the mediator. And he says in sum that the main reason, his language, that we needed a Savior who's fully God and fully man, fully human, is, and this is his language, that God wanted to declare his infinite love. Remember everything we talked about on Monday and Tuesday. The incarnation is that God wanted to declare his infinite love so that the eternal son didn't take on human nature merely for a moment, maybe even a dramatic moment. I don't know if you realize this yet, but theologically, the Orthodox tradition has argued that when the son assumes a human nature, he would, as Casper says, never again set aside the human nature. We have an eternal mediator. Becoming human was not a temporary necessity. The son assumes a true and full human nature, and this shows his continuing love and solidarity with his children and the rightness for which he made us. Thus God did, and here is Olivianus again, God did declare simultaneously his unchangeable justice and wrath against sin and his mercy toward us. God's wrath against sin accomplishes his mercy towards us. His justice, which consists in setting us right, restores the communion we had lost. And here we're focusing on his children Justice was not the manifestation. When we think about God's justice in this case with the coming of Christ and him crucified for his people, this is not a manifestation of a disgruntled deity. It's the strong arm of the Father rescuing and protecting us. Think of it this way. Think of it as like a virus, the virus of sin that clings to us, that destroys healthy cells. Sin has attached itself to all of humanity, and it kills us. It kills all the good. This virus kills all the good of God's creation. So that God's justice and his wrath are not the unthinking outburst of a temperamental curmudgeon, right, who sees kids on his lawn and turns on the sprinkler and says, get off my lawn. That's not what God's justice and wrath is about. Far more like chemotherapy to fight against the very plague of cancer. Justice or wrath is needed to fight against this plague of sin. Wrath in this sense for God's people consists in the destruction of that which would destroy us. And justice is the larger picture of restoring us to the place where we belong and fitting us for it. There's obviously much more that could be said there, but I want to turn to Christ as our elder brother and priest. The Son 
is now eternally the enfleshed son. He is the great embodiment of the philanthropic love of God. Christ, the great substitute and sacrifice, our brother. John Calvin, reflecting on this, reminds us that the biblical doctrine of adoption, so beautiful, it brings us into this warm embrace of our Heavenly Father. But Calvin says, while it is true that the doctrine of adoption brings us into the warm embrace of our Heavenly Father, don't miss the other biblical truth that it is affirming that Christ is our elder brother. Christ deals with us, as Calvin says, in a brotherly way. He is now and will always remain our brother. The author of Hebrews tells us that Christ, our elder brother, not only suffered on our behalf, which he did, but for my purposes, this is quite important, this next part. This elder brother of ours, who we're connected to by the Spirit, as we're by the Spirit of the Son brought into the family of God, this elder brother now, it leads the singing of the praise of God. As Hebrews 2 says, in the midst of the congregation. I was thinking about this as I was preparing, and I can't totally unpack this, but it, I was here, I don't know, five years ago or something, and, and in this room and in, the, in chapel, I had prepared one talk, and there was um, something quite tragic that had happened at the seminary right before, so I ended up preaching on Psalm 22 and this Hebrews 2 passage of Christ, who's the one who leads the worship, and how do we think through that? So if you're interested in hearing more about that, but here he is the one who leads the congregation. We trust him who partook of the same flesh and blood that he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. Our elder brother delivers us from slavery. As you know, he said, the author of Hebrews goes on later in chapter 10, therefore he had to be made like his brothers and sisters in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Like us in all ways. It's very interesting. There's a lot to be said on that. How is he like us in all ways? Right? Has Jesus been tempted in all ways as you are without sin? We think, well, yeah, but then all of a sudden you think about it, you go like, well, actually, Jesus was never tempted as a single mom with four children wanting to throw one of those kids out the door or out the window of a skyscraper because it had been such a bad day. So does that mean the author of Hebrews is not telling the truth? No, 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 because to be truly human is not to be a generic human, it's to be a partic take on a particular human nature to be truly human. The particularity of Christ is what lends the Messiah, the significance for the universal. The particular is crucial for the universal. And the generic, while it's tempting, undermines our actual particular humanity. He has been tempted, as John kind of says, in all manner of temptations. But he's never wanted to shoot one of his seminary professors. But he was tempted in all ways, right? Having personally united us to himself as the li and living in faithful worship of God, he now leads us in the continuing worship of God. This will consume a lot of later in the talk. He, he, he takes on this representative role of our participation in his life, and that representation is vital theologically and pastorally for a vision of the Christian life. Put it differently, as the Apostle Paul does in 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus, the incarnate son, is the eschatos Adam. He's the last Adam. But unlike the first Adam, he faithfully obeys the Father as he depends, uh, as he depends on the life and provision of the Spirit. He is obedient. I mentioned this in passing the other day, yesterday, I think, but... 
I hope you understand the, sin, the sinlessness of Christ is quite important. But I have a growing worry that that classic doctrine, again, as it's been repeated but not really examined and unpacked, we've lost the significance. And so we've started without thinking to think, well, the sinlessness of Jesus is really like Jesus has a checklist. Is like, okay, I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to do this. I shouldn't do that. And it really is just he did a bunch of things and we don't. And I don't know if you know this, but a lot of the theological world for that and other reasons have given up on the idea of imputation. I actually think the idea of imputation, where the righteousness of Christ is held to our account, is important. But in order to appreciate the importance of it, we need to slow back down and go, wait, what is this righteousness of Christ? What is this faithfulness? And I'll just tell you, the righteousness of Christ, put as briefly as I can, is about he is in perfect communion with the Father from beginning to end. It is about worship. This is why, for John, like, if you love God, keep his commandments. But it's not because the commandments are what make you into, they are a reflection of who God is, of this love and shalom. Anyways, Augustine in the Encridian goes on talking about this living and dying without sin, who Jesus, in his perfect human dependence, upon the love of the Father, presents a sacrifice to the Father as the life that we should have lived. Only in this specific way, and Augustine's so good with wording, only in this specific way could human pride be rebuked and healed by the humility of God. Human pride rebuked and healed by the humility of God. The Messiah represents God's philanthropic love for us. God loves us, philanthropy. That's the, the love of humanity. I don't know if you know that. That's what that word means. But the Messiah is God's philanthropic love of us, but he also represents, embodies, and accomplishes human love for God. The philothea, uh, thea, or the theophilia. In other words, Jesus is the faithful worshiper. He is the head of Israel. He is restoring Israel from unfaithfulness by a life of unbreakable communion with God and with his sinless relations to his sinful neighbors. He is, as you know, the representative. He is the covenant keeper. He is the final Adam. He embodies Israel. He functions as his body, leading the church, of which he is the head. Jesus positively accomplishes a life of right human relations with the Father and in the Spirit. He is this innocent lamb who offers himself, giving his life for theirs. I want to read you this other quote from Augustine, just because part of what I love about Augustine is he often does theology as an act of prayer. Listen to this. For our sake he stood to you, Augustine is praying to the Father. For our sake, he stood to you as both victor and victim, and victor because victim. For us, he stood to you as priest and sacrifice, and priest because sacrifice, making us sons and daughters to you instead of servants by being born of you to serve us. With good reason is there solid hope for me in him, because you will heal all my infirmities through him who sits at your right hand and intercedes for us. Were it not so, I would despair. Many and grave are those infirmities, many and grave, but wider reaching is your healing power. You might have, we might have despaired, thinking your word remote from any conjunction with humankind had he not become flesh and made his dwelling among us. In other words, it's a fancy way of saying, it's one thing to say God is love, God cares. It's another thing to gaze into the human eyes of Jesus. And as Thomas looks into this risen one and in staggering awe says, as he's looking into human eyes, he says, my Lord, and my God. This mediator, 
that the prophets pointed forward to, the mediator, his life, death, and resurrection that we now continue to look back at. Listen to how Ambrose puts it. I love this. Ambrose was a mentor to Augustine. Ambrose says this of the incarnate son, um, that the incarnate son is our mouth. Christ is our mouth through which we speak to the Father. He is our eye through which we see the Father. He is our right hand through which we offer ourselves to the Father. Unless he intercedes, there is no intercourse with God, either for us or for all the saints. This is me basically trying to tell you that the gift of grace is not an idea. It's not a, just a propositional statement. It's not just a, 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 something like here. Uh, no, no, no. The grace of Christ is central to the gospel of King Jesus because Christ is the grace. He is the grace. He is both our representative as priest, prophet, and king, and elder brother, but he is also the object of our worship, as God. This is why he, in his incarnate life, is the way of grace for fallen humanity. And your, your and my only hope is if we're connected to this gift of God in his death, resurrection, and ascension. So we center the Christian life on the life of Christ. Let's think through this. But here's the question for us now. Should worship be through Christ or should worship be to Christ? Should worship be through Christ or to Christ? Joseph Jungmann wrote one of those rare seminal works that provokes discussion not just for a few years but for decades, for much of a century actually. The original German edition of his work came out in 1925. It was called The Place of Christ in Liturgical Prayer. Jungmann was a serious, very impressive patristic scholar. He knew the early church super well. And in this famous book, he spotted what he thought was a development in the history of the church's worship that concerned him. What he does amassing all of this kind of data is he believed that the biblical and earliest Christian practice was always to offer prayers to God through the Son in the Spirit. To God through the Son in the Spirit. And in that way, 1 Timothy 2.5, he's the mediator. The idea was not that you, you do not pray to Christ, he argued, but you prayed through the Messianic representative. He argues that later practice in the history of the church shifts away from prayers to the, uh, they, they shift, and all of a sudden you start having people pray to the Son, ad Christum, not just per Christum, through the Son. Now what's interesting is Jungmann believed that that shift takes place, and his, his argument is that shift takes place, he thinks, because of the debate with Arianism. And you remember in your doctrine class, right? So this Arian, in Arianism, the idea was, well, the Son of God is really amazing and wonderful, but he is on the ledger between creator and creature. He's on the creature side. And as the church wrestled through that, Jungman says, in response to that, they end up switching, and now all of a sudden they don't just pray through Christ, but they think they must pray to Christ. And Jungman argues the result of that was the beginning of undermining the full humanity of Christ. Now, I actually think there's much to what Jungman says in terms of the rich Trinitarian liturgical approach to God used in the early church. But in my opinion, and I'm certainly not alone in this, he does fail to appreciate the significance of worship that is directed not just through the Son, but to the Son, and not just in the ancient church, but even in the biblical material. And that, it won't surprise you, I don't think we should pick between the per Christum, right, and the ad Christum. We should pray both to Christ and through Christ. I think he gives some lopsided conclusions. 
But let's just dive into some of this. How is it that we offer our prayers to the Father through the Son and by the Spirit? Do we not also offer them to the Son? Christ as mediator, as you probably know this idea, but Christ as mediator, he both represents God to us and us to God. My guess is everyone in this room knows that. And really for the rest of the time to this morning, all I want to do is help you think more carefully about what it is you and I say we know if he really represents God to us and us to God. Because when we say he represents us to God, often we reduce it to the cross. And I'm not, you know, someone asked me yesterday about that. This is not about undermining the cross. It's making sure we understand the full significance of the cross. So that when he takes on our sin, as we say in the Reformed tradition, and gives, or as Paul says, I mentioned, yeah, he who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. This has to be fuller. It has to be about the full life of Christ. He is both the lead worshiper, the faithful, pious, perfectly righteous, covenant-keeping Messiah. But he is also the one worthy of worship because he is always never less than God incarnate. He's God incarnate. And this strange and mysterious dynamic has never been easy for the church to articulate. But let's... Try and think through this. So for the rest of the time, I'm going to spend a bit of time really focusing on Athanasius, the early church father. Some of you probably read his book on the incarnation, which is a classic. I'll be drawing on some other material of his when he's wrestling with the Arians. But then I will focus on Revelation chapter 4 and 5, particularly 5 for the sake of time. So how can Jesus both represent God to us and us to God? Athanasius, as you may remember, is responding to the great threat of Arius and this idea of reducing the sun to a creature. Athanasius insists that there is none other, that the sun is none other than God from God. He's God from God, the eternal word who becomes fully and truly human. But the problem was that the Arians... Say, how can Jesus be considered, quote-unquote, God when the scriptures apply very human terms to him? Has this ever occurred to you? You read the Gospels. You read about Jesus hungering and sleeping and weeping, and they highlight he receives, he gets, he's at the right hand of God. None of those things really sound like God. They, they're very creaturely. Don't these kind of expressions, the Arians argue, show that Jesus is merely a creature, one dependent upon God, but not God himself? Well, I do think in response to Arianism, we are tempted to ignore the very creaturely actions and attitudes of Jesus in the gospel. It's kind of like when you get questions like when, you know, does Jesus know everything? And... You get a question and said, and Jesus says, I don't know the day or the hour. And Christians are like, I mean, he's joking. <laughs> right? Or, or it's something like Jesus looking at him and say, do you know the day or the hour? And he kind of flips around and goes, okay, I'm, I'm human now. No, I don't. And then he, I'm not going to do that again. I'm too old for that. <laughs> But he flips around again, and then if you ask him a minute later as God, then he's going to like, I got it now. I don't know if you know, but that's huge Christological problems right there. But there is something, in light of the Aryan threat, there's something tempting to go, like, let's downplay his full humanity. Let's upplay his divinity. But the answer, as you know, is neither to deny his humanity nor his divinity, but see how they relate in his person and why it matters. If we undermine his humanity, something Apollinarius does later, and to be honest, some scholars say, at even Athanasius, at moments of a lack of clarity, he seems to anticipate Apollinarian. There's some the problem, but at his best, at his best, he, he resists that. Because if you undermine the humanity of Christ, we lose sight of the profound good news of the gospel. 
So the question is this, why is this so vital? And here is Athanasius, this is the shortest answer he gives that I think is brilliant. Why the incarnation is this, that he might minister the things of God to us and ours to God. That he might minister the things of God to us and us and ours to God. The incarnate Christ is not only the great revelation of God, but also our Savior, who stands in our place as our representative, who takes the weak, distorted, even sinful, solely to tempts at faithfulness and praising God, and he makes them beautiful and right because he is the embodiment of grace. He, as Athanasius says, receives our human affections, including our weeping and weariness. He receives them from us and offers them to the Father, interceding for us in him. And in this sense, this feeling of forsaken, hunger, and hurt. Again, Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That Jesus Christ on the cross in the psalm, you'd have to think through that. The beauty of the gospel is that the God who cannot sleep, he never sleeps. The God who cannot eat, who cannot weep, who cannot die, endures these experiences by becoming fully human in the Son. And he endures them for our good and our salvation. He bore a true body and that it was his own, as Athanasius says, acting on behalf of us in our fallen humanity, restoring what had been lost, what was lost, this perfect, free, life-giving communion with God with ongoing ramifications. He goes on to argue, for of such gifts mere men were not worthy, but the word had not needed them, right? He, he, basically, the short version is, many of you have read Anselm in the medieval period where he says, why the God-man? And the argument is because humanity owes a debt it couldn't pay, but God doesn't owe it. God could pay it, but he doesn't owe it, so you have a God-man, the necessity. Well, some people say, well, that's just a medieval thing, and, and that's kind of built on an uh, economic system in the middle. No, no, no. In the ancient church in Athanasius, you find the same argument there. So there's a tension. It appears wrong to speak of the eternal son obeying and worshiping God, and I would caution you against that. that is a form, it can be a form of ontological subordinationism. Since the Son is none other than God, he is not in any sense less than God. Whatever it means for God to be God must be true of the Son. And yet, as incarnate in the state of humiliation as a man, as a human, the Son incarnate does obey the Father in the Spirit, doing his will, most centrally offering worship, living in uninterrupted communion with the Father through the Spirit. The problem the Arians wrestled with is they were trying to read the obedience of the incarnate Christ back into the eternal Godhead. But that wasn't the point. Of, in fact, it can undermine the significance of the incarnation. The wonder of the incarnation is that the Son of God, who is homoousius, of the same nature as God, he is homoousius with the Father, very God of very God. But don't miss this. We learn this in doctrine. He is homoousius with the Father. But the creeds go on to say he's homoousius with us. Did you know that? What that means in the creeds is whatever it means, whatever your definition of godness is, whatever it means for God to be God, that is true of the incarnate Son. He's truly and fully God. But similarly, Whatever it means to be truly and fully human, that is also equally important to talk about the Son incarnate. The one man who is connected with us in such a way that when he died, we died. And that when he is seated at God's right hand, we are seated there with him right now. You had a bad morning and you yelled at your roommate. And you're wondering about God's faithfulness. 
Beloved, by God's Spirit, you are even now at the right hand of God because you are connected to your head, Christ. And we live in this tension of the now and not yet. But Christ is the one who rightly relates to God, neighbor, and even the earth, doing so for us and our salvation. He approaches our frightening enemies of sin, death, and the devil, and he overcomes them for God's glory and for our good. Let me jump to Revelation 4 and 5. There's a fair amount of scholarly debate about the book of Revelation generally in terms of, well, you know that, but that's not what I, I don't just mean like, I have a particular thing in mind, let me be clear. So there's scholarly debate about the book of Revelation in terms of, is it generally reflecting first century Christian liturgy? Is the book of Revelation constructed in such a way that it is meant to reflect what you find in first century Christian liturgy? Right? A fair number of specialists argued that there's this liturgical setting that shapes the overall design in general, but even Romans 4 and, uh, Revelation 4 and 5 in particular. For example, Oscar Kuhlman makes this memorably sweeping claim. Listen to what he says. He says, the whole book of Revelation, from the greeting of grace and peace in chapter 1, verse 4, to the closing prayer, come Lord Jesus, in chapter 22, 20, and the benediction in the last verse, that whole thing he says, is full of allusions to the liturgical uses of early community. In other words, as the ancient church would worship together and have their liturgies, he is arguing you find that reflected in the book of Revelation. It is reflecting the earliest liturgies. However, since the publication of that book and others, other scholars are more hesitant to imagine such large structures shaping the book of Revelation, although very few would disagree with the fact that throughout the apocalypse, it's hard to read it without seeing liturgical material throughout. But Coleman's argument too often seems to assume that the seer, the writer of the book, is simply moving from his own experience in the church, in the gathered community, and reflecting it and pushing it up into the heavens. And one of the problems with that, those claims he and some other scholars were making is, it is overestimating the unity and sophistication of the earliest church liturgies in terms of what we actually know. It seems to assume too much unity throughout the known world at the time among these Christians. But, and I think those critiques are fair, but what if the author of Revelation isn't simply projecting his earthly experiences unto the heavens? What if it's moving in the other direction? What if it's moving from the heavens to the earth? Did the heavenly visions in this book were they meant, the heavenly visions, were they meant to shape and inform the growth of liturgical practices in the early church that weren't yet there? G.K. Beale, for example, argues along this line. He says that just as the heavenly pattern of the tabernacle shown to Moses on the mountain was to be copied by Israel in the construction of their own tabernacle, so here John employs the heavenly vision to shape earthly church patterns. You get the idea? John, unlike what Coleman's saying, it's not that John has been to a local church on Sunday and goes, oh, this is what it's like, and he's projecting it into heaven. John, by the Spirit, has a vision of what the heavenly liturgy is like, and in light of that heavenly vision, that's then supposed to shape the earthly liturgy that is developing. Now, Paul Bradshaw and other liturgical scholars have been cautious about claiming too much. And I think that we need to be chastened, but I do think that reversal is quite helpful. But I also think Larry Hurtado, Hurtado, who not too long ago died, but an excellent New Testament scholar, I'm with him when he argues that in Revelation chapter 5, for example, Revelation 5 affirms the standard for the proper pattern of worship of the recipients of the book. In other words, when you receive this book of Revelation, you are receiving what is meant to be something that can guide your corporate worship. 
This standard, he says, is not necessarily about the particular instruments in worship that you see, for example, in Revelation 5. It's not, he's not actually, don't miss it, he's not saying the incense, the crowns, the thorns, or, or I'm sorry, the thrones. <laughs> uh, that was just to see if you were still with me. I know it's a little hot and stuffy in here. I wish I could give you all Legos to play with, and I did, <laughs> I did mean that. Um, what does it mean to play with Lego? I don't understand you guys. I thought we could be friends. Um, but, but this idea of this is then shaping us. It's, so it's not about, it's not about thrones and, and incense in the worship service necessarily. No, no, no. What he's saying here is it's the, what, what is determinative for the earthly worship is the object of that worship. And the object of that worship is the lamb is the lamb, God and the lamb. Hurtado elsewhere in a different article reminds us that the seer envisions, as he says, the heavenly reality behind the related worship by the elect upon earth, giving primacy to the heavens over the earthly liturgies, so that he concludes the gift for which the earthly elect praise God in anticipation of their full enjoyment of them are secured in heaven. It's an eschatological tension. We worship in the now and not yet. We are confident of what is to come. We are confident that one day we will be in perfect, unhindered communion with God, even though it's not yet. And that then shapes and enlivens our current Worship. We have hope because we are united to Christ who's already secured our, pos our position and who leads the worship of God. And in response, we recognize and praise him not merely as our representative, but as our God. Jesus, the Messiah, as Revelation 1 and 22 say, he is the first and the last. That is not meant to minimize his humanity, but to frame it. Don't forget the book of Revelation, like the New Testament in general, is a heavily Jewish book. I'm not giving you text on all of these things, but you probably know this, right? Creatures are not permitted to worship creatures. It doesn't matter if they're angels or a beast or a dragon. Only God is worthy of worship. So Revelation's depiction of praise and worship toward the Lamb reflects, despite what Jungman had said, reflects this very early Christian practice that demonstrated the belief that he is to be treated as none other than how one treats God. That is the lopsided nature of Jungman's claims, so that our prayers are not just offered through the Son, which they are, and that's appropriate, he takes the incense of our prayers and makes them beautiful. But our prayers are offered to the Son, to him. Because Christ, to use Richard Bachman's, I think, helpful phrase, Christ is discovered to be in the divine identity. God alone is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And yet this same Jesus is also the one who identified with Israel, with God's people, the one who acts on their behalf and in their place. And Revelation presents Jesus as the unique divine human agent who carries out God's purposes. So Revelation 5 speaks of the seer of Patmos who notices a sealed scroll on the right hand of the enthroned one. And the angel asks, Who's worthy to open the scroll and to break the seals? And clearly it's a rhetorical question. It expects no one in heaven, and it even says, this is very important, no one from the heavens or anyone, it says, under the earth can be found. And don't miss this. The seer starts to weep. There's no one worthy. In the heavens, above, or the earth beneath. And then an elder interrupts the tears. And he gives the words of hope. He says, weep no more. Why? 
Because the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of... I don't know what that was. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> just going to say what you were thinking. The lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And we hear that he hears a word of power, and he expects to see a warrior. But what he sees in verse 6 is a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Two loaded symbolic images emerge, one kingly and the other priestly. Both are keys are understanding the passage. In verse 5, he hears none other than the, the, the one from the line of Judah, this kingly lion. You can imagine hearing the kingly lion who's worthy to break the seal. But in the next verse, it says he sees... So he hears this kingly lion. You might think that's what he's going to see, but what he sees in verse 6 is a sacrificial lamb who takes on the priestly role, offering the full and final Passover offering. You see, the king and the lamb are not two different people, one and the same. Jesus the Messiah, both the conquering king, the sacrificial lamb, building on Revelation 2 and 3 that has just gone before, where the same Messiah in his prophetic role talks about the situation in the seven churches of Asia to their leaders. We're now, later in the book, in a position to see that this prophet is also the lamb who acts as the king. He alone takes the scroll on behalf of the people, even as those around him fall prostrate before him. He expresses his kingship not through tyranny, but by bonding with his people, sacrificing himself on their behalf. And notice, the people do not merely express gratitude. They worship the lamb. Now remember I asked, why doesn't God just snap his fingers and say, it's fine? JPM sweet in my opinion, right, it just really gets this in his commentary on Revelation. He says that the, the scriptural vision from the opening of Genesis was for humans to have dominion over the earth. And so, however deeply humans had abused God's trust, God would not bypass humanity in bringing his purposes to completion. The God of creation is the same as the God of recreation. He's not going to bypass so only a human could and should open the seal. And this man was truly embodied only in Israel and in the man who was to come, the Messiah. The one who speaks prophet and acts on behalf of his people as priest and king. You have a stunning revelation. And I hope we don't take it for granted. The stunning revelation is that this one both is worshipped and he leads the worship. Holding the bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, the mediator who is slain and ransomed by, the, by his blood for God's people, also becomes their hope of healing and praise. He is the way to which our prayers imperfectly, someone like, I don't know if I can pray for that, I don't have good motives, my motives are mixed, then don't pray ever. Beloved, pray. Distracted, mixed motives, angry, whatever it is, pray. Because he is the one who takes these prayers, makes them rise to the heavens as objects of their praises. This unique representative, the Messiah, acts on behalf of his diverse and scattered people. And he turns us into a kingdom and priest to our God. Following the king and the priest, believers now are directed to live in Christ's kingdom and to serve as his priest. All of this is accomplished in a singular person. So we turn to him again in praise. And all of a sudden, the sacrificial and kingly images come together, worthy, back in Revelation, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Now watch this. 
and I'm just about done. You remember where I started on Monday about God, out of the overflow of his love, he creates creation. Creation's meant to reflect and participate in his love. Listen to the book of Revelation. This lamb who's slain, who's worthy, it goes on and then says, climactically, this isn't just for people. In chapter 5, 13 and 14, it says climactically that every creature, is that in your theology? Every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all created humanity, right? All in, all in the sea, all of them are to respond by praising the lamb and worshiping him. Originally, God created humanity to reign graciously and wisely over the earth, and the failure of Adam compromised the goal. But God was faithful to his promise. He brought it about through the eschatos Saddam. As Gregory Beale says, Jesus functions as both the executor and heir of the promise. In lamb-like innocence, he executes the final judgment receives the promises, and includes his people as participants, both in his priesthood and conclusion. Final paragraph. Beloved, Jesus is not just a wonderful example of a particular human being. He is also God who is worthy of worship. So not only can prayers be offered to God through the Messiah, but also offered to him. As none other than our God, the Messiah rightly deserves our praise and worship. But this Messiah is also our friend, our elder brother, our great, real, human representative. He was not play-acting, but genuinely united himself to represent us to God, offering the worship that God deserved, but which we constantly refused in deliberate rebellion. Christ alone was not only full of faith, but he was perfectly faithful. He alone could open the seal. He alone could serve as the prophet, priest, and king. And so he has led us to triumph through his incarnation, sacrifice, resurrection, ascension, and ongoing reign. Jesus, the Messiah, the incarnate Son of God, is is the embodiment of the grace of God. Let me pray. Our God, again, we gather, and sometimes it feels like I'm, it's a fire hose coming out of me. But we pray that the things that are of you, that are faithful to your word, that reflect reality, might linger, and any missteps might fade. We pray that you would increase our love for you in and through your Son and by your Spirit. May the beauty and wonder of Christ light up our souls again. We speak of him often, but it is easy for us to reduce your incarnate Son to a proposition to an idea that helps us solve a problem. Lift our gaze from the words to the word that we might praise, <laughs> that we might be comforted. We pray all this in the name of the risen King. Amen. <laughs>
part of what we have to understand is that human creatures commune with God in a particular kind of way because we're reasoning beings, and so it looks a certain way. But that's partly why I ended with that quote from the book of Revelation, that, that this, this idea that every creature under heaven and earth is meant to reflect and honor the creator. And we, from the beginning, were meant to help and that, that creation foster that praise. So I'm not actually trying to humanize creatures. I don't know exactly what it looks like. But I do know it, this is where the language of shalom becomes important. I do know there is harmony, there's wholeness, there's rightness. Now, that, that becomes very difficult in terms of animals eating each other. What does it mean to honor God? Those are all legitimate and right questions to kind of ask. All I'm trying to say is when you take Genesis and you take Revelation, the picture is not less than human souls, but it seems to be bigger. And, and so this idea is whatever it means for all of creation to live under the, uh, well, put it this way, as Paul says in, in Romans, right, all of creation is groaning. If you believe that text, then the hope is there will become a day when creation no longer groans. And that's what I'm trying to get at. And it is true that communion of human creatures with God, others, the earth, etc., inevitably is different than whatever communion might mean for rocks. And so I think you could legitimately go, maybe, maybe we need to pick a different word, because communion, like for John Owen, means mutual relations, but there just is, throughout the Psalms and others, there is something fairly animated about creation communing with God or in relation with God. I don't know what to do with it, but I don't want to deny it because I don't know how it works. Thank you. Uh, the next question says it's from Peter Orr. I'm questioning if that's true because the verse reference is wrong. So <laughs> regarding the humanity of Christ... Oh, it is from you. I was trying to save you embarrassment, Pete, but the real, this is from the real Peter Orr. Um, regarding the humanity of Christ, Peter would love to hear your thoughts on Romans 5.10 and what it means that we are saved by his life. I'll read you the verse. Thank you. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? So the question again from Peter is, can you talk about what it means that we are saved by his life? Yeah. That's a great, that's a great question. And, and Romans 5 is a significant example of this kind of stuff where you have this contrast to the two atoms, right? Um, and that's, that is where I'm trying to get at this idea that in the classic Reformed tradition, our argument is not simply that on the cross, Christ takes our sin, but there is not just an imputation of our sin to Christ. There, there's not just Adam's sin imputed to us. There's not just our sin imputed to Christ, but there is the imputation of Christ's righteousness to us. And I, I think, however cumbersome it can be, um, and as you know better than me, Many New Testament scholars, especially Pauline scholars, are raising all kinds of questions about the language and idea of imputation. But I think that's the kind of text that says, no, no, no. His life really matters. His faith and faithfulness really matters for us. And we benefit from it. And so part of what I'm trying to slow down is to say, so what is so important about his life? Because it is true um, that... Uh, was it Oscar Kuhlman who also said uh, the, the Gospels are basically uh, passion narratives with brief introductions? Is that? You probably know. I don't know. Okay. Oh, Kaler. Okay, yeah. Sorry. Kaler in America. Keller here, I guess is how you say it. <laughs> I was like, Tim Keller said that. No, he's stealing that. It's not, it's not true. So, but, but so one of the questions is, why are you emphasizing the life of Christ when the Gospels don't spend all this time talking about the life of Christ, right? That's, it's very interesting. In the 19th century and lives of Jesus, the quest for the historical Jesus is a big thing, and you start having all these people writing biographies, and the great danger of writing biographies about Jesus is, surprise, surprise, he looks exactly like whatever cultural people are writing them, right? So he looks like a nice, 
good, educated German 19th century liberal, or he looks like a good 1960 American hippie. It depends on who's writing the narrative about Jesus. He reflects them. He's a projection of ourselves. That's a huge danger. I think the overreaction to that problem by some of our conservative sides is we haven't made sense of the life of Jesus. It is true the Gospels don't take you, don't provide a biography, but that in no way should be taken as saying his life doesn't matter. Because what we do know is he is without sin, right? And you get these weird episodes where all of a sudden it's like he's in the temple and his parents left him and, you know, people say, like, I, we want to parent biblically. Well, use that as your biblical, right? <laughs> Forget about your kid for a few days. But anyways, so you get this idea. The glimpses are, the glimpses are he, his life is faithful. It's righteous. And what we know is that the righteousness of God and this faithfulness what loving God looks like is keeping his commandments. Not as a to-do list, because it reflects the creator and how he made the creation. Commandments are meant to remind us, reconnect us in a broken and sinful world with the right ways that God's good creation was meant to function. And so the very life of Christ becomes so important in that. So we don't want to fall into kind of a left-leaning Jesus is just a great example for our lives. But we shouldn't then say Jesus is not an example for our lives. But he lives this faithful life of communion with God, right relations with neighbor, earth, and self. This is partly why the very healings of Jesus, maybe another question we can talk about this, but the healings of Jesus, I'll just say the healings of Jesus, what he's doing really signifies some certain things about who he is and what he's doing. I, yeah. Maybe I'll talk about that later. Thank you. This one's from uh, Casper, back from the grave. Uh, will the consummated new creation transform Christ's role as mediator, and if so, how? Uh, I guess it would depend what you mean by transform. My short answer would be, no, I mean, he always ever lives to make intercession for us. And one of the things, when the author of Hebrews says he always lives to make intercession for us, I think sometimes we get this vision, this can, these things, un, un, unexamined assumptions betray certain problems in our theology. Sometimes when we say, well, the author of Hebrews says he ever lives to make intercession from us, for us, the image is the father's really angry. And the son is up there in eternity forever going, come on, Father, love them. And the Father's like, I love you, I don't love them. But because I love you, I'll put up with them. And so Jesus is spending all his time trying to convince the Father to love us. But when you read in the upper room discourse as Jesus is preparing the disciples for his departure, he says, the Father himself loves you. His whole point is not to make the Father. So part of what's going on, I think, in this idea from the book of Hebrews that he ever lives to make intercession is as the incarnate son who didn't give up his humanity when he ascended into the heavens, he ever lives as the intercession. He himself is the embodiment of the prayers, right? Something like that is how I'd want to unpack it. The next question asks, where do the scriptures command us to love the earth? Uh, there seems... It seems to make sense to care for it, but love seems a bit far, placing the earth in the same category as persons. Um, if I ask you to care for my grandmother, but don't love her, how does that make you feel? All right, well, maybe that didn't work for you guys. <laughs> just, just thinking on the fly here. Let me ask you a different question. Do you think God loves what he made? And maybe you don't think he does. And I would ask you to think, think about that. Because if you think the only thing God loves are human creatures, then we have a much longer conversation. If God loves what he made, 
then it's good and right to love what he made, to love it rightly. Now remember what Augustine said, that's not to love sinful things. Right? This is part of what's going on in the Gospels when, when we receive warnings like, don't love the world. When, when we receive warnings like, do not love the world, that doesn't mean don't love the cosmos. It doesn't mean don't love your grandma. It doesn't mean don't love your puppy. The world is, as Jesus says, the world, if the world hates you, just so you know, it hated me first. The world doesn't represent the material world. It represents that which is in rebellion against God which is not what you should love. That's disordered love. Again, because I don't think you can love too much. So rightly ordered love is to God and neighbor that then brings these other things. So I definitely think you should. It's kind of like Proverbs, right? Watch how someone treats an animal. I will tell you a lot about that person. So do you treat animals different than humans? Yes. And I, I think I understand what's behind the question about we should just care for creation, we shouldn't love it. I, my, mm, I'm going to be nice here. That's too small of a vision of love, in my opinion. God is not trying to get you to be more, less loving. That's why I began with the Trinity. God is love. And out of the overflow of his Love, he creates not just humans. Humans are the pinnacle. I hope that's been clear. We are meant to cultivate. We are the ones in that central role. I'm not trying to lessen humanity. But you don't make humanity greater by belittling the rest of everything God made. That would be my... And let me, let me put it this way. It may not seem immediately related, but I will tell you, especially since I'm in a room with many future ministers, this question is directly related to the people in your congregation wondering if their jobs nine to five matter at all. Does it matter that they go to work and create code for computer? Do the veterinarians, I went for a run yesterday, ran by this animal, do veterinarians in your congregation, are they honoring God when they're working? Or is the only way you honor God when you're actually specifically evangelizing with your words? And one of the things you must do is help your people understand that you guys who are paid to be professional spiritual people are not the only one who are spiritual. This is all related to loving God's creation, not just abstract souls. Please don't hear me saying evangelism doesn't matter. But is it not true that God loves a godly mechanic making an excellent car? If that's not in your theology, yeah, then we need to talk more. The next question is, um, in light of what you've delivered this morning, what can we say about the old adage that God hates the sin but loves the sinner? Yeah, it's very interesting because there was a time when someone had told me, like, that's, uh, that's a new statement. It's not very true. But I actually read that almost word for word in John Owen, which, which I thought was interesting. And I think at its best... Rightly understood, I think that statement is basically saying what Augustine is saying. God loves what he made, but he hates the sin that we made that distorts the good he made. And I think rightly understood, when it is love the sinner, but don't love the sin, that's what that's trying to get at. I fully recognize pastorally and theologically, there's no clean break between the person and the sin, right? Right? We actually theologically believe sin is not just stuff you do, but because of the fullness of sin, this is part of who we are, right? Um, but I do think that pastoral adage has, has pretty helpful significance for us. Like, well, in my setting in America where we kind of have culture wars, I've heard Christians say, well, these are, we're in a wartime ethic, so I don't need to be loving to them. 
because listen to what they're saying. It's sinful. I'm like, well, I don't know. Jesus talking about enemies and turning your cheek and stuff. It doesn't seem like you get to suspend your ethics in those moments. So, yeah, that's part of what I say. Next question is, why is the incarnate rather than the risen Christ your foundation for understanding humanity? And there's a reference here to O'Donovan. Uh, should we teleologically nuance his humanity? Did you write this one? I did not. That's imp- <laughs> that means there's at least one other person besides you that reads Oliver O'Donovan here. <laughs> I don't see a quote in here. So yeah. Oh, did you did you here. just add the O'Donovan part? <laughs> My estimation of more just went up. This is great. Um, I actually absolutely think you can make the argument that the resurrection is a center. But the reason I'm doing all of this work is I don't think you can make sense of resurrection without incarnation. So... Um, you know, it is, it is this, it, as, as you know, like when you get this language that Christ is the firstborn from the dead. So you have this significance of understanding true humanity in this resurrected one. But that resurrected one, to be understood, has to be understood in light of the first Adam. And I, I just think it's quite significant to understand you can't, there's a reason why resurrection is totally pivotal but you need life and death to make sense of it. Um, Yeah, I guess I just wanna say, uh, it's hard for me to imagine being able to have a robust resurrection theology without first a robust incarnational theology. But a theology that is purely incarnational and neglects resurrection is bankrupt, absolutely, yeah. Someone has said, and and a number of questions actually have been on a similar theme here. Uh, I cringe when people pray to Jesus, thinking about the Lord's Prayer and the directive to be praying to the Father. Should I be more open to this in personal and corporate prayer? And I think along with other questions, should we continue to direct our prayers primarily to the Father through the Son? Yeah. Well, that's a a really good question. Um, And this is an example of the tension between exegesis and theology. So the church has, by and large, not just Eastern Orthodox, not just Roman Catholic, not just uh, the Puritans, for example. Many of you have the Valley of Prayer. That, is that right what it's called? I feel like I'm screwing it up. It's jet lag. Anything I get wrong, it's not my fault. So, um, but you'll find, I mean, the Puritans and John Owen, who wrote so much on the, on the spirit, prayers can, can and should be offered to every divine person because prayers are offered to God. That's the argument. Now, it is true that is often more theologically driven than exegetically. Because it, and, and so what I would say is, I do think we can't, as Owen talks about brilliantly in his book, Communion with God, when we offer, put it this way, there is no way to pray to God, as Owen says, apart from the person's. You never approach God except in and through the persons. There's no God behind the gods, right? Now, but to pray to any divine person is to pray to none other than the triune God. As Gregory of Nazianzus says, when when I approach the three, I find myself encountering the one. And when I encounter the one, I find myself surrounded by the splendor of the three. Gregory of Nazianzus says that John Calvin quotes that. It's just not translated in his footnote, but it's there. And I think that's, that's quite brilliant. Now, having said that, I do think theologically, since God is God and the Father's God, the Son's God, and the Spirit's God, prayers can be directed that way. But I think part of theology, like I said the other day, is not just knowing what's true, but how much emphasis you give things and how do you practice things. And I do think exegetically and in the history of the church, the vast majority of focus seems to be to the Father with some to the Son, and the Spirit is a bit more debated. So I would just say kind of pastorally, but I, and, and part of the other thing that the tradition, including the Reformed tradition, will talk about is there is something to crying out to God, and sometimes the, the very prayers 
do provoke in us a particularity toward a, divine, a particular divine person. So it's like, oh, Holy Spirit, would you comfort your people in their grief? Because that is a work often associated with the Spirit. But how does the Spirit comfort God's people? By applying the very work of Christ to their lives, right? This kind of thing. Um, uh, and, and anyway, so I do think it is good and right to pray to all the divine persons, but I also think there is a biblical, theological, and pastoral reason that in practice, the majority of those prayers are directed to the Father through the Son by the Spirit. We might have uh, one more question here for you. Do we, this comes back to the mediatorial role of Christ. Do we still need a mediator after the final judgment? And why does the Son need to be human in the new creation? There's, there's various ways I'd like to answer that. Um, are there any Lutherans here? Mark, my, yeah, actually, you did some right. He's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> loving, Lu loving Luther does not make you a Lutheran. So, I also love. I'm not going to pick on Lutherans. I just wanted to know what I was getting into here. So, whether or not. This is actually me trying to answer that question. Whether or not you know it, you know all these debates about the Lord's Supper and the sacraments and what's going on there. Sometimes, and maybe as a student, you can be forgiven where you're like, dude, chill out. Why are you guys debating about this? Is it his body? Is it his blood? What do you mean by that? This kind of thing. What you may not realize is the debates there are actually about the humanity of Christ. And the concern is between Calvin and Luther and the Reformed tradition and others, the concern was that Luther and others, as they have the ascended Christ rise, he basically dissipates in his humanity so that if he can be in, with, and under the elements, uh, if, if there is consubstantial with the elements or if it actually turns into it with a different tradition into the very body and blood of Christ, you've actually lost the real humanity of Jesus. Let me put it to you differently. I don't know if you know this. This is a great theological question. Lots has been written about this. Here's a question for you. Where is Jesus right now? At the right hand of the Father. I love that. People are like the right hand of the Father. That's a good biblical answer. Where is that? And if God, where is God? Does God have hands? You're like, at the right hand of the Father, but he has no hand. <laughs> And, and you, in a different context, if you're in a debate with a Mormon in evangelism, you're like, God does not have a body. And they're like, well, where's Jesus? You're like, at his right hand. So actually, in the Reformed tradition, we think it's very important to continue in humanity of Jesus, though it's very hard to answer the question. And it is a good right answer to say, well, he's in heaven. And then you know, well, where's heaven? And well, we've got multiple dimensions now, and we've seen matrix. So I don't know. It's possible. But... <laughs> I actually think it's very important not to give up on the humanity of Christ, continuing humanity. And that's part of what's going on in the sacrament debate. And so I, whatever that means, not just for now, the incarnation, God sending the Son and the Spirit to take on human nature was not just a small thing. That is God's great Yes to his creation. Let me put it, tie in these other questions, and I know we've got to end. Because people are like, God loved his creation, but not anymore. It's not. Jesus incarnate is God's great yes to creation. He loved what he made. Sin is distorting it. He enters in. You and I tend to feel guilty about our bodies and shame and all of that. And he enters into a womb and is born, as Tertullian says, with afterbirth. And people think, that's gross, that's irreverent. No, until you believe in the afterbirth, you will never understand the glory of the gospel. If you think the afterbirth is grotesque and below God, you don't understand the humiliation of God in Christ. 
But once you see the wonder of the depth of the humiliation in the Son, you can start to understand the depth of God's love for us. And it also then means we can be reconnected with our bodies. But all that to say, I think that is now he ever lives to make intercession. He has entered in in solidarity with us. And I don't think that's ending. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kelly. Why don't we give uh, Dr. Kapik a hand? Just in view of what we've just heard, um, as we conclude, I'm going to actually do something maybe a little bit strange, but I'm going to read Article 4, which talks about Christ's humanity and how he continues to be human now. Christ did truly rise again from death and took again his body with flesh, bones, and all things appertaining to the perfection of man's nature, wherewith he ascended into heaven and there sitteth until he returned to judge all men at the last day. Please pray with me. Our Father, it's a great joy to, to see the grace that has come to us in Christ. You're a great gift of your Son, taking on real human flesh for us and for our salvation. And not just dispensing of that, Lord, but keeping it now, even through the grave, again for us and for our salvation, so that we might be with you forever. We give praise to you, our Father, for this great gift of your Son, and we give praise uh, to your son for his faithfulness on our behalf. And we thank you, Lord, for your spirit that works this salvation so deep within us, transforming us into the likeness of Christ. May you continue to do so, please. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen.